guys, uh, let's introduce you to Matt Eric. Matt's a journalist, author, and has his own sub stack that you should probably check out. Matt, thank you for coming. Hey, thank you for having me on. There he is. There he is. We'll have him yeah. on short, the screen yeah. shortly. The great game is in the house, man. How you doing, Matt Eric? Hey, very well. Very, very well. Thank you. Awesome. Fam, do you want to start off? Do you want me to jump into it? Because I got, I got a million questions here today. And ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't shared the stream, now is the time. Matt is in the house. Let's get it out there. Hit the like button. Hit the share button. Uh, this is not going to be a white belt conversation. This is going to be more like brown and black belt. If you haven't been following Matt, you don't know what you're missing. He's got some great stuff. Uh, is it the great game on Rumble is where you have some videos too as well? Oh, yeah. And thank you for that generous int introduction. Uh, yeah, the uh, the weekly show I do on Rogue News is uh, The Great Game uh, with V and CJ. And uh, yeah, you can get that on Rumble on uh, roguenews.com, uh, my own website, Canadian Patriot, a few other places. Perfect. Okay, great. So I'm going to start, Pasta, because you go right into the jugular. So I, I just want to like start <laughs> off with the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine scenario. That's what's happened thus far, right? We were just discussing the EU banning Russian oil and how that's uh, essentially destroying the economy. They're basically going to copy what the United States is doing. And right now things are not great in the US, as you probably know, a 41 year high inflation, food shortages, the greatest country in the world cannot get baby formula to mothers. Congress, um, um, every single Democrat gave uh, billions of dollars to Ukraine and we continue to do so. So that is what, what's happening. So what is the end goal is my question to uh, this conflict from the EU, NATO, uh, US perspective? Yeah, the, the end goal, um, to keep it in a simple principle top-down uh, format, the end goal is ultimate uh, a restoration of feudalism. I mean, to, to unpack that a little bit more, um, there has been a romanticization um, in the minds of a certain oligarchical caste, which has been maintaining itself for many generations around this idea of a pristine world of stasis and well-behaved talking cows that was more uh, pronounced in the days before the Renaissance, long before the American Revolution and before the Golden Renaissance, when there was a uh, an explode, something changed. Let's just keep it at that. Something changed during the 15th century renaissance. And all of a sudden, new ways of thinking about natural law, the nature of man, the relationship between man, uh, mankind, humankind, and God, completely revolutionized in action. And we had a complete spike of population growth, but not just in quantity, but also in quality of life. Um, new breakthroughs in medicine, geometry, astronomy, architecture. I mean, look at the music and the, and the, the beautiful art that exploded onto the scene. Before that, there was before that period, it was known as a medieval period, where the majority of the people were relatively, uh, you know, had a low life expectancy. There were there was not that much that differentiated human beings or the masses from talking cows that lived on a plantation under a feudal lord who lived in their castles, having orgies and living in decadence. Um, that was again not even that great for the the oligarchies living in the in the castle. In hindsight, they didn't even have soap or running water. You know, like they're their hygiene wasn't that great and their life expectancy wasn't that great either, but they romanticize it, which is why today we're now in the wake of uh, several generations <clears throat> since the death of JFK, where there has been a reinstatement of an agenda to bring back feudalism, but with certain new technological innovations under a, a technotronic sort of twist. And mm -hmm. the catalyzer for that is the collapse of the Western transatlantic banking system, which is being put into a controlled demolition, artificial scarcity is being accelerated um, as a consequence, as part of the plan. And the uh, the thing about this is that th those who are trying to operate or manage this controlled demolition are a little more than uh, angry right now, are very angry, they're very enraged because the, the New World Order script is not falling into line the way it was supposed to a decade ago, 20 years ago, things were supposed to look a little bit different right now. There, you know, um, there was not supposed to be any opposing system to their depopulation agenda, their one world government. And, in, you know, <laughs> increasingly what we've seen is that a variety of nations and, and ancient civilizational states have broke, have basically chosen not to commit suicide or, or to be sacrificed on this altar of Gaia, which is really what it is under a, mm -hmm. 
a twist. There's there's new language to it, but it's the ancient guy cults effectively repackaged for a modern age, which we're being expected to to kill ourselves under. Hence the the lacking of food, the lacking of available energy, which is otherwise very very remit. Like we could we don't have to have these crises at all. And uh, and there's no there's another game in town. And so there's a vying over who's <laughs> going to shape the conditions of the new system that's going to come online. Is it going to be based on this old feudal new world order agenda, or is it going to be based upon something a little bit more dignified? Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. So what we're alluding to here is the new other game in town is where, the, it, where a lot of us kind of debate. We don't know what's going on in front of us uh, is all just theater and everybody's playing together, but there's also this theory that no, Mr. Vladimir Putin uh, has kind of broken off from the West and say, no, I'm not going to play your game anymore. There's a lot of evidence that shows that um, in Davos, they're really not talking about him anymore. They're not crazy about him. And it does seem by all the actions from the West that he is defying their great plan that you talked about, about, and I believe you alluded to in the crosstalk episode about putting us in a box and making that box smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Uh, but right now the Bilderberg group is suspected to be meeting in DC. That, that's what everybody's kind of blowing the alarm on this morning. And I had the, the, the luxury, I should say, or the honor of speaking to Vanessa Billy today and then Jason Burmes and now yourself. Uh, it's just been an amazing day. Uh, but how sure are you that Russia, and also let's talk a little bit about China and India, because you know there are people who immediately point to Xi Jinping with that classic picture with him and Klaus Schwab saying that, no, no, he's still part of the whole thing. But how sure are you that these three nations, when it comes to Russia, China, and India, are not part of this global agenda that these psychos that pretty much from the Bilderberg group have put into play? Okay. Um, yeah, from the standpoint of principle of action, like I, I try to approach things from the, the standpoint of what is the governing operating principles of the oligarchical system as a continuous system going back to ancient times, right? So I'm looking at like, what is the invariance? There's things that change, things that don't change. There's certain characteristics of the, of empire, of the way that, of the type we're discussing here, which is always the case. Um, the seeking for absolute, absolute control is one. But um, a seeking for population control, depopulation specifically, dumbing down of the, the, the talking cows, um, because the talking cows don't have access to their proper creative um, mental powers, you encounter thus uh, boundary conditions, limits to resources, limits to development that justify then the idea that we're overpopulated. And there were, this is not a new thing, right? Like going back to ancient texts from ancient, uh, Ancient Rome, there was, uh, and even before that, there's discussion about culling the uh, the human cattle every once in a while by the elite. This is not so this is not a new thing. It's just the consequence of dumbing people down and then having no discoveries that you need to have in order to overcome the pop, the limits to growth. There's always limits to growth, but they're caused by ignorance. So <clears throat> that's one thing. They want to dumb down, reduce the population. They want total hegemony from a from a, um, a master class. So one one group at the top having absolute power as an executive branch over the entire system. And the system is defined as a static system, um, a whole that is simply the sum of its parts. And because the whole is not more than the sum of its parts, that's another thing about empire. They always define the, the whole as a material thing, right? There's always a diminishing rate of returns in time because you cannot create more energy, energy than you use up. Like any engine where you put gas in the tank, you know, that the pistons move as, as the gas is burnt up. And as as the as the gas is burnt, burnt up, there's less energy to be distributed to maintain the actions necessary for the engine to function. So it's 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 moving towards heat death, and let and it's not going to come up with new gas right from within the tank. Only human beings can do that because we're we're a creature of mind, so we can create new resources and make new discoveries. So they don't want us to think like that. They want us to think like we're we're this closed system, you know, all that exists is all that could exist, and it's just the elites managing the human zoo. So when I look at Russia and China and also India increasingly, what I'm seeing is a defiance of those basic parameters. The, uh, the, the trend over the past 30 years, especially since China kicked out George Soros in 1989, Russia took them a little bit longer. They only did it in 2015 um, and banned the, you know, the open society operations uh, within both countries. They're not allowed to operate there. They're, they're running our society, mind you, but they're not allowed to operate there. So go figure. Um, since then, there's been an, an overarching trend towards mass industrialization, new scientific progress, and um, overall anti-depopulation orientation policies. I don't see that in the West. In, in terms of what I, what I mean that is I see that there is an overarching um, policy, like 
China has produced, for example, um, 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail moving 300 to 500 kilometers an hour. Um, we have, in the West, uh, produced almost zilch. Um, we're still using 1950s technology. We, we've, we've shut down. We were, more, we were closer to having this, this stuff in the 1970s than we are today. We shut it all down because that was the intention, was to get us back into the Stone Age. Um, so you have that. You have also um, a defiance of divide to conquer regime change policies. So both Russia and China together have introduced, have, have worked together very closely. And it's right that you ask me about Russia and China together because they are together. Um, they have put their, they, the reason why there was not a successful Iraq treatment or Afghanistan or Libya treatment in the case of Syria or Venezuela, for example, has everything to do with the intervention by Russia, China, uh, especially also in Kazakhstan, uh, many other, there's many countries, it's a big list. Um, so you have an avoidance of regime change, and there's also the attempts by these countries to expose the bioterror apparatus, which has been really grown into a giant behemoth monster since the anthrax days of, of you know, September 18th, 20, 2001, when there was another inside job called anthrax that justified this entire bioterror complex by the Pentagon. That's been something that both countries have been looking at for 20 plus years, have been speaking openly about and trying to figure out how do they shed light on this or stop this in case of the, the Pentagon operations in South Korea or in Ukraine or in Georgia. It, there's a lot of it. 200, actually 326 last time I checked, US run biolabs internationally. So that you have all of these things. And so, yes, when George Soros has said in 2010 positive things about China or, or Kissinger or Justin Trudeau has said they like the totalitarian system of China. They, they, what they're looking at, what they're specifically refer, referring to is the central controls. They like the social credit, central controls. They like that type of command structure and surveillance. They love those things. Everything that China is actually doing though, in terms of function, design, and intent, they hate that. The ability to big build pro build big projects, uh, in, enhance the power of other sovereign nation states to have full spectrum industrial economies, like we see in Ethiopia, Kenya, every country they do business with. They hate all of that. So, you know, I, I got to differentiate that. And I do see a bit of like, yes, China, Xi Jinping or Putin will go to World Economic Forum conferences. Um, and that's part of history. You know, people who sometimes good people go to bad meetings and bad people go to good meetings and good people say bad things, but then do good things. And then bad people say good things and then do bad things. And that's part of like the ambiguity of history. And you can't judge some surface appearance sometimes, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing. Like Putin, he's a spy at heart. So he just went in there to see what they were talking about. Now he's like, all right, I got all their information. I'm pulling the chain and doing my own thing for the benefit of Mother Russia and against the West. I'm sorry, fam. Go ahead. No, I mean, I, you know, I tend to agree with you um, on the pushback from uh, Russia, at least um, uh, China. Uh, there's a lot of going on with uh, the global South. I want to kind of bring in the global South into this Latin America. There is the, you know, this idea that we're heading towards a multipolar world from this unilateral world. Where does the global South fall into this agenda in terms of, you know, the, the relationship between China and say other countries uh, like Nicaragua, Venezuela, and uh, Russia as well. Uh, we know I Iran has also been involved in supplying uh food and certain items into Venezuela. There, where, where does all of this lie in terms of the multipolar polar world um, when in the context of this whole global agenda? Well, I, I think that you have, like the, the fight is, like I said, over how the, we're going to get a new system. That's that's going to happen. Like the current system is, it, there's nothing within the current system that that we've known for the past 50 years that has within it the power to to exist in the way that it has existed. Um, it, so it was a, it's a, I don't even call it a banking system. I call it a bubble. Or or Siliwanov, the uh, the finance minister of Russia, said, don't call it American money or euros. Call it candy wrappers. <laughs> that's what it is. It's candy wrappers, and they they want us to give them oil and and our commodities, and yet because we're producing real things, and they and they want to give us candy wrappers in return. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's, it's not a big loss that we don't have this market because they're looking at the fact that the whole Western system is going to go up in hyperinflationary smoke. The South American, Latin American, Caribbean countries, LATAM, uh, I would include Mexico into the mix. Um, overall, they have a better sense of what globalization actually is. 
behind the veneer, the surface veneer, because they got the uh, the, the coup d'etat assassination, uh, debt slavery, IMF conditionality side of things that have really subverted a lot of development potential that they have had over the past 80 years. And I think all of our the viewers of this program are aware of that. Um, so they're a little, they have less delusion about what it is. Um, and I think there's a greater hunger to find something which is actually viable. Um, the only game in town, like right now, Russia and China, especially China, well, Russia doesn't have as much economic power to do things, right? Because their central bank is still a private central bank run by a lot of IMF assets, um, whereas the nationalist component, right, the the the, the not deep state part of Russia is has a lot of control over their military and intelligence, not as much control over their cultural policies, um, their media, a, a little bit on the media, but not as much as you'd think, and uh, banking. They, they don't have a lot of control over the banking. That's a big fight currently. China doesn't have as much of a of a strong military uh function it's much weaker in that sense uh relatively to other countries or to russia specifically and especially the us but it has a very strong capacity through its national banking system that it never permitted permit permitted to be privatized it has a greater capacity to emit long large-scale credit for projects that are like 10 15 20 year projects that benefit the recipient nations that is so it's not really debt slavery the way the the CIA is trying to convince us that they're using debt slavery or something. So they have currently in South America um, about 40 uh, stakes, controlling stakes in about 40 ports that have all really just occurred in the past five, six years primarily. Um, that's a strategically important thing to have that. And a lot of investment uh, offers for building real infrastructure across a variety of countries. I know Argentina is soon going to become a member of the BRICS. Um, the Kirchner's People hate, a lot of people hate the Kirchners. I, I kind of, li I like them, um, especially Nestor. And I, I think his, Christina, who still has a, a lot of influence in the current, ironically, it's called Kirchner, uh, government, government um, has a good understanding of the nature of the, vul the vulture funds, the bankers that have been using neocolonialism to keep everyone in underdeveloped. Um, th there's a lot, again, China has offered a lot in, in terms of real development aid that's not just aid, but real no strings attached investment opportunities into building major infrastructure, which has been blocked by 75 years of World Bank controls over that region. Um, so I think that they're real. They would jump on board very quickly to a uh, a new, uh, like if you had a new type of Eurasian Monetary Emergency Conference, kind of like what was ha what happened in 1944 in Bretton Woods. If something like that, and I think it will happen sooner than later, were to be uh, would to happen in the coming weeks or months ahead, most of the South American countries at this point would rather get off the Titanic and get on, get on something that floats. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of positivity there. <laughs> they must be having sweat and bullets over there. If the Bilderberg group is meeting in DC right now, I can oh, yeah. only imagine what's going through their mind, but let's stay on this topic while we're talking about it, because you did talk about, you know, the monetary system, the, the dollar be almost like candy wrappers. It's not backed by anything, right? Yeah. The ruble is now worth more than it's ever it's ever been worth right and yeah. can you explain a little bit about how russia's currency is backed by commodities and what that is doing actually now uh to the western monetary system the a la candy wrappers since this military action began well there's still a, a fight it's it's a transition uh it's a transitionary thing right now with the ruble so there's still because of the influence of certain people like Elvira Navidulina, who's the head of the, the Bank of Russia, she has been resisting those like Sergei Glaziev, who's a major player um, as a minister of, of uh, integration of the Eurasian of Eurasian affairs. He's in charge largely of the program of what is animating Eurasia, uh, sorry, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, sorry, Eurasian Economic Union, um, which has a deep, deep relationship with China. And specifically, there's a project underway to uh, create a new financial architecture, which Glaziev has been spearheading for some time. It's accelerating now since the Ukraine operation has really gone full steam ahead. Um, but again, the, the paradigm of what Glaziev is talking about clashes with what Elvira uh, Nebulina, Yale educated, I don't trust her. Putin seems to think he can manage her or work with her. I don't know, I, I, I'm not on the inside. So I'm looking at this and piecing it together from the outside, right? Um, what is her position exactly in Russia? So people she's are the governor answers. of the Bank of uh, Russia. Okay, got it. Yeah, and uh, very, very liberal-minded, very much, um, I mean, she's made the argument to keep the ruble uh, floated, like 
tied to the floating floating rates, floating exchange rates, which makes it more prone to speculative attacks, the whimsy of the casino economy, whereas Glaziev and, and many others in Russia have been saying, no, we got to peg it, fix it to uh, a more fixed exchange rate that that inoculates it from the type of speculative attacks by a George Soros, for example, who's able to, you know, carry out an attack by buying up and then and, and selling short on a currency when you want to cripple a country. Um, and, and it also it creates a climate of long term thinking when you have fixed exchange rates. But then what do you fix it to? Right. And so Glaziev has made the point, as have many others, uh, that it should be pegged towards a, an array of about 20 commodities, gold being one of them, but also um, wheat production, various industrial indices, like things that are physical. You can like have r physical um, physical metrics to judge whether the money in circulation is legit or not. So it's a fight right now. It's not fully there yet, but it's moving ahead in a, in a pretty healthy way. Um, and most importantly, conceptually speaking, their governing class it has put a high priority on hard industrial growth, especially with a look towards Siberia, the Arctic, and Eurasia. Um, with large-scale deals with Iran, uh, Russia and Iran have major uh, have a, a major 25-year economic security partnership with energy as a focus. Same type of thing that Iran has signed with China. Um, so these are these are things that are animating the entire thinking and paradigm of that of the ruble, which is also tied. Last thing I'll say to um, breaking free of U.S. dollar hegemony, as as yeah. you know, Siliwan have said, candy wrappers. Yeah. They're 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 balancing. They're um, allowing payments and trade to be finalized by local currencies, whether yuan, uh, ruples, rupees in India. So a lot of increasing amounts of local partner countries are 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 settling their trade in their local currencies and getting off of their addiction to this time bomb called the U.S. dollar, which is great. That's that's a healthy thing to do. My question is more uh, related to this whole um, push by the United States and the EU, this focus on climate catastrophe. Yeah. We have in the United States, of course, Build Back Better, the the, um, the Green New Deal. We have all these projects uh, pushed by the same people that are voting uh, for more war, that are, are pro, you know, a, a strategic nuclear uh, attack of sorts. And a lot of what we've learned about this goes into what the Great Reset is. And it, it, they seem like Trojan horse projects to obviously bring in this new world order where there's a, a constant control. And of course, you know, for example, the poor get told to recycle more or to not drive as far. We've seen the legislation be put in the bills to control how much uh, people drive in the United States yep. in bills that are thousands and thousands of pages long where nobody reads them. And yeah. then, um, the, the of course, the rich never get told to not fly their planes or, you, you know, use their your, their yachts. But what what is the the I guess the the air like the order like the purpose of this uh, build back better uh, green new deal type of legislation in terms of what they the this this the new world order wants to put out there? Yeah. Well. In short, it, it touches on what I what I mentioned at the beginning: um, global technocratic depopulation under a feudal order um, with a modern twist. Um, their computer models, since the early '70s, there has been a popularization of the idea that digital uh, computer models using binary, you know, one zero uh, logic, uh, could map out optimal population levels on the Earth. And that was originally promoted with a lot of backing by groupings associated with the Bilderberger groups um, called the Club of Rome, for example, was one of the first early organizations that utilized computers to uh, conduct population. Um, what are the limits to our growth? How do we calculate that with relative knowledge of the rate of growth of agricultural land, land spaces overall, available resources, and uh, rates of pollution increasing? So they, they int introduced a bunch of metrics. And then they, they ran them in uh, a series of probability statistics that were built into uh, their models. It was published in a book form in 1972 called the, the Limits to Growth. It's sort of the Bible of the modern environmentalist movement, um, which most environmentalists don't even are not even aware of uh, what's actually underlying their own movement. And what they charted out is that by a certain point, 
50 years in the future, we'd be way overpopulated, we'd have a, a, a resource crisis, and thus we could predictively act now in, in the 70s to start uh, solving the problem before the problem hits, right? Um, this is called the Neo-Malthusian Revival, because the old, this is basically just the repackaging with a little bit more complexity of the old ideas of Thomas Malthus, the old British Empire, British East India Company economist, who justified the idea of killing babies, killing the poor, the useless eaters to stop overpopulation. That was disproven in the 19th century by, you know, people who were demonstrating that no, when you do things a little bit differently from the British Empire and you give people the opportunity to use their minds, you don't have those same problems of the Malthus crisis. So it went out of style. People stopped <laughs> respecting Malthus for a long time. And 200 years later or so, they wanted to bring it back and they did in that form. Um, this, These people who did, and one of the earliest platforms that popularized this was the World Economic Forum at its second meeting, brought in Aurelio Pache, one of the Club of Rome co-founders with uh, Alexander King. And they gave a platform to, to you know, produce, to, to showcase their, their computer models. It was promoted by the Trilateral Commission of Kissinger, Zbigniew, and uh, David Rockefeller. Um, it was brought in by Kissinger into the NSSM 200. Like Kissinger in 1974 uh, re rewrote the entire system of foreign aid protocols of the U.S. government called National Security Memorandum 200, which can be read. It was declassified in 1991. And uh, it's horrific. He literally says that uh, instead of encouraging uh, full spectrum development to like Egypt or Ethiopia or Mexico, the way former governments had been doing um, as U.S. foreign policy, like instead of allowing them or encouraging technological growth or progress, that's actually wrong. We were misguided. We didn't know about the current science of population like we do now. And he said uh, the new policy must be to encourage uh, depopulation. Um, We'll have to give them incentives to sterilize, to use birth control, to uh, we'll we'll threaten them with food constraints if they don't abide by the type of um, changes in their governing structures that we demand in order for them to get loans. And he he listed 15 countries. Um, China was also high on his mind, but he didn't put it on the list, um, which is where the Club of Rome was introduced into China in 1979-80. Uh, their models were brought in as part of the the, the package that uh, Kissinger negotiated for China to access industry for the it desperately needed it it was it had done a lot of self mutilation in the glorious uh, not the glorious sorry the uh, <laughs> that was Britain um, the the Cultural Revolution which was really a, a big misstep so they had a lot of poverty a lot of self self induced damage and they needed industry so Kissinger said okay you'll be the forever slave the slave society you'll do the sweatshops we'll be a consumer society. We won't, we won't have industries anymore in the West. We'll be first world, you'll be second. And you'll stay just, just you'll have enough money just to keep your nose above water, but not to buy the goods that you produce. That'll be for our dollar stores. And so the Club of Rome, the, the one child policy was brought in, not as a Chinese policy, but as, the, as part of this package. Um, they, China has been still trying to heal from that. 40 years later, they've, they've undone it, but it's still like a lot of damage that they're trying to remediate now. And uh, and so today we're now 50 years into the wake of this thing <clears throat> and what they've done with the Green New Deal, the Build Back Better, all of this stuff is they want to, they've made us stupid when it comes to an understanding of the science of energy and population. There, there is a very, a, a longstanding awareness that, the, that there's a direct correlation between the quality of energy that a society has as a form of like fire to burn that allows us to do things, right? It's like a, a, a metabolism for society. Energy is like our metabolism, right? Fire is, we have an internal heat, right? We go to the gym, we burn calories, you know, eat the energy, energy bar, give you calories to burn and you do work, right? And you need to replenish. So whether it's burning wood, burning uh, coal, burning oil, burning, um, getting into the atom, a new form of, of geometry of, of energy mass relationships that can be harnessed for good or for bad. Um, in each, phase, it requires certain one discoveries and technologies, right? Because you with ignorance, you can't move from one set to the next. But you then have a greater potential to have to support more people at a higher quality of life. Um, the, the writings of uh, I learned all this stuff by studying the writings of uh, the recently deceased American economist Lyndon LaRouche, who goes through this at length, fascinating stuff. Um, but the empire has been looking at this as well. And they want to get us addicted to qualities of energy that are so shit poor, low quality, 
windmill solar panels that you cannot sustain industrial civilization. You cannot make a windmill with windmill power, right? That it's it's the opposite of sustainable because you cannot burn. You cannot with the quality of elect of, of electron motion that you get from windmills or from solar photovoltaic cells, you cannot get the high intensity heat required to melt industrial steel, process concrete, do the things you need for seven or eight or nine billion lives to be sustained. It forces you into a tiny little box. Um, and that's what they wanted to do by first blowing up the current system, then saying, okay, hydrocarbons and nuclear are off the table because those are all bad. And Alexander King, the, the founder of the Club of Rome, even admitted in 1991 in the, the forward of his book on the first global revolution that um, <laughs> that in looking for something to unite humanity, they were they entertained, he says, pollution, uh, the idea of global warming caused by human activity fit the bill just fine. But he said even that wasn't adequate because the real problem is humankind itself. How can we get mankind to recognize that we are the, the enemy that we need to uh, deal with. We are the cancer. So these were all just cover stories that the, to get human beings to go along with or acquiesce to our own um, seeing ourselves as a cancer and thus dealing with ourselves like you would a cancer, cutting ourselves out. Windmills and solar panels are not going to do it. That would cause us to uh, to depopulate. Russia and China again and India will have none of it. That's the reason why the, the first gr green world government attempt failed in 2009. Another reason why I, I tend to trust Russia and China and India currently is because it was because India and China together locked themselves in a room at the COP, COP 14 conference when they were supposed to come out with binding climate reduction treaties for decarbonization. They basically locked themselves in the room, the, the Indian and Chinese delegations and said, we're not coming out. <laughs> we're not, and they sabotaged the whole world government conference. It didn't happen the way it was supposed to back 12 years ago. Um, so they're, they're doing it by investing in the more coal, more hydrocarbon, uh, more nuclear than ever before in history and saying, yeah, 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 we, yeah, global warming is bad. Yeah, yeah, let's, so we need more hydrocarbons. That's why plants eat it. <laughs> like, isn't there like a middle ground for this argument? You know, I mean, I want to, I wanted to go somewhere else, but while yeah. we're here, isn't there like a middle ground for this argument? Like we don't need plastic, right? We don't need to, we need to, we don't need to deforest mm. the planet to wipe our ass. We can grow hemp at a crazy rate we can use hemp for energy and power and stuff so isn't there a middle ground to this argument because uh, you, you know I, I still think too much of one thing is really bad and i'm not saying we switch all over to currents windmill solar and whatnot but there's other forms of uh, of energy and especially when it comes to the whole plastic situation i mean i'm sorry but this is where george carlin was wrong you know I mean? like plastic is bad we can do other things than you know polluting our oceans with this crap and it, and it is an oil product too as well so i mean uh, isn't there a middle ground for this conversation where we can have some form of like I'm, cleanliness yeah, I'm, in our not society? Into, I'm not into extreme extremist opinions and so I, I like nuance I like shades of gray oftentimes where, which is usually where you uh, <laughs> you find the truth um so certainly I, I tend to agree with you that we should be looking at um alternative forms of like hemp is certainly something that I find very interesting and and we should be definitely exploring and, and utilizing it to a much fuller potential totally. But at the same time, a lot of the, the uh, effects of pollution that we currently suffer from are completely unnecessary. And if anything, um, Jesus, you know, like <laughs> the amount of there's no reason to have the plastic in the oceans, like plastic island and things like that floating in the in the yeah. ocean. We don't need the, like those are so unnecessary. I don't necessarily think we need to get off of plastic per se all at once. That might take time to transition over generations, in my view. But um, I do think, though, that you could have, when you look at what has been sabotaged over the past 50 years, especially since JFK and his brother died, there's been a constant sabotage effort over discoveries that we were close to making decades ago, and we were probably closer then than, than we are today to fu nuclear fusion power, um, all forms of, um, I mean, things like there, there were actual government-backed programs for things like uh, the nuclear fusion torch. Um, both cold, hot fusion, like there's so many different pathways to tap into the the binding of light atoms that both create then uh, heavier atoms, helium and other heavier atoms that also have an energy mass release. Um, we were yeah. we had programs for a, a fusion tor the fusion torch. If we had not sabotaged that, canceled it back in the early 70s, what that does is it it gives you the power to take any minefield. I not not mines like bombs, but mine like uh, I said minefield. I meant the uh, garbage field, right? Garbage dump. And you, you can basically 
process, you disassemble <laughs> all elements in the, of the garbage into their, their constituent atoms. And it, you basically render it a plasma because all, all matter can exist as a, a solid, a liquid, or a gas, or a plasma, four states. By heating up the, uh, the, the, the molecules into a plasma state, utilizing certain magnetic signatures, you could then filter out whatever um, atom or isotope you seek to desire, whether you want pure silicon, you know, you can get that. There's more in, in the average uh, cubic meter, uh, or sorry, cubic mile of uh, average ocean water, you have more aluminum, more iron by magnitudes than the world produces globally per year. It's astounding. It's just so diffuse. It's useless for us to access it because it's so diffuse. Whereas with the plasma torch, you can actually start the whole idea of mining and what matter is all changes. And that's the sort of thing that people were thinking about in policymaking circles and science um, 40, 50 years ago in a more serious way than they are today. That's That's been crippled in our school system. It's, it's, it's like foreboding. And a lot of scientists have even died, mysterious deaths who are moving us in that direction. Um, so th I think that whole thing needs to be discussed. You know, like we have to put light onto what's been subverted because we should be in yeah. so much more of an advanced situation now than we actually are. And Matt, what are they hiding at Area 51? That's what I want to know. They got some <laughs> shit over there. We... <laughs> Pam, do you have a question? Because I'm going to go with Harry, Henry, Henry Kissinger. If you yeah. Have... Well, um, for me, uh, I guess the question is, um, you know, what well you want to go into henry kissinger so i don't know i, I don't know if you want if you want to go ahead and do that i was going to go ask well i just want to know what he thinks that about henry kissinger's statement right now uh recently at davos and like how far mm -hmm. up on the totem pole because it was obvious soros came out with the same type of bullshit speech we got to stop the authoritarian boogeyman yada 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 and then we have to do all this crap to do so but kissinger kind of threw that curveball right when he made that statement about as far as what's going on that Zelensky should just shut the hell up and, and negotiate right now. Um, and it was really caught me off guard. I'm like, Henry Kissinger said that? So, and you know, and Henry Kissinger goes all the way back to, you know, the the, the development of the Bilderberg Group back in the day. So it's, uh, I just wanted to get your opinion on where, where that came from, because it was kind of shocking at a left field to hear Henry Kissinger say those words. Yeah, you know, I'm not really, you know, my speculate, I have to speculate. I, I don't really, I can't get into Kissinger's nasty. You ought to got to speculate I don't want to get us, into my, That's why I called you. It's like, you got to speculate. I want your speculation. Sorry. Right, so my up. speculation is either one, he's he's always played a bit of a gang counter gang operation, right? So people have often thought that Kissinger is sort of the uh, the, the nemesis to Zbigniew Brzezinski, for example. Kissinger was more active under, under uh, Nixon. Zbigniew uh, was more active under Carter fact is they had different flavors of imperialism and they were both trilateral commission leaders it was a fake it was a fake opposition it was two different pathways to get to the same result right um he kissinger was slightly more of a a liberal real politic imperialist um kissinger had had a different approach um now kissinger i know one thing about him and having read his his early works um on the congress of vienna when he was an early bilderberger group inductee in uh, 1959 just out of you know school he was he was himself um, um, groomed by um, a Rhodes Scholar named uh, William Yandel Elliot, who ran a, uh, a a sort of Oxford an Oxford department of young sociopathic boys that he cultivated in in Harvard. Uh, Kissinger just being one of them. Uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and and uh, Zbigniew actually were two others who were uh, Huntington's boys. Uh, it's creepy and, and weird. So anyway, Kissinger um, in his first works glor says, and he makes it explicit, it's sort of like his, his lifelong manifesto of the Congress of Vienna being the most important period of world history that governs his entire life. Congress of Vienna, 1815, being the time where you had the restoration of the monarchies after the age of chaos of Napoleon. And that was the period of the restoration really of oligarchical systems. The old hereditary families were able to reinstate control. You had a, a sphere of influence, a, a, you know, a, an apparent stability, but it actually was just apparent. It wasn't a real stability. And, uh, and it's really a religion of stasis, a religion of stability that he defines as the highest good. Anything which disrupts stability is evil. The greater degree to which it disrupts the stability that he supposes is the most natural state for human society to exist. Again, it's like fix no change is the religion, right? The greater degree that it, that it destabilizes the system, the greater degree it is evil. The irony here is that human creativity is the thing which causes the greatest destabilizations to a system because you introduce a new, new discovery, it makes all of the former ways you were doing things in the old, with, without that discovery, 
without that technology, obsolete. Um, so that completely is very upsetting for power hungry freaks. It, it's it, for humans, it's very exciting and great. You know, we, we love new discoveries. Like that's what makes us discover awe and wonder in the universe and makes us love human beings, right? Because we all can make these discoveries. There's, it's not, it, it, it's not dependent on which, which caste you're born into. So um, Kissinger is like that. Now, one, either he's playing a gang counter gang operation against, uh, you know, Soros who's just being Soros, you know, <laughs> um, calling for, you know, ou ousting Xi Jinping, overthrowing the CPC, ousting uh, Putin, calling for a total war with Russia, uh, and and trying to sound like the good cop, bad cop. Or maybe he's 99 years old, maybe, and perhaps he really does recognize that the launching of a nuclear war on the earth would undo his lifelong work, which I don't think he really wanted nuclear war. I think a lot of what he did was to try to create a system of one world government to get rid of the danger of nuclear war, but to bring about a total uh, enslavement of the masses by a managerial elite. Now, if today we actually do have a heated nuclear war being launched. That really is unstable. That that's that that's a very uh, unstable situation that then arises. So maybe maybe he's a, uh, be responding to the reality of the hell on earth that could easily happen. Maybe I don't know that, but that's my thinking. Yeah. No, I yeah, that that makes a lot of sense because I don't think wow. he would suddenly change his <laughs> entire mindset. But um, so my question is along the lines of the pandemic, and this is like my final question. Um, in terms of what we're seeing, there's this debate where some say, well, it's the age of the pandemic, which is why we're seeing, you know, all these coronaviruses, a monkeypox, and all of that. And then there's the other side that says, no, this is this is obviously done uh, by design. And, you know, we are on YouTube, but um, just just your opinion on on what what you think the uh, discoveries of the, the, the bio labs funded, of course, by the United States in Ukraine have uh, have to do with, of course, a lot of the the pandemics that we've been seeing in, in recent years. And mm. if that is, of course, um, something that is also uh, manipulated as well, in my opinion, you know, a lot of that um, has been in the United States, obviously extremely manipulated. And um, I, I do think that the a bioweapon is, is another uh, type of attack that can be used against the people. I'm I'm holding my mouth a little bit because in my mind I'm trying to think how could I answer this without getting this video erased from YouTube. Uh, when you said we're on YouTube, he was smiling, fam. He's like, well, we can ah. go to Rockfin only if he wants to. You want to wait two seconds? No, no, no. I could I could try. It's good exercise. I mean, I'm I'm. I'm, I'm I, it didn't I, work out. Video down. Strike yeah. the combo couch. <laughs> I mean, my my YouTube channel has been in the penalty box for two weeks now because I I think I said a bad word. Um, so I'm. I got to practice this. Um, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, oh. there, I know for a fact that since let's go for history first. Okay. Cause that's usually safer. So, okay. um, after world war two, it wasn't just a bunch of, uh, Nazis and Nazi doctors and Mengele and, and, uh, Ukrainian Nazis like, like Bandera who were absorbed into Anglo-American intelligence to fight the big bad commies throughout the cold war. Right. That happened. That happened. It was called Operation Gladio. It, it also had, you know, different elements to it, um, and we absorbed a lot of Nazi scientists. Um, not all. A couple of them might have been good guys, but for the most part, like people like Mengele and all of his research. Huh? Operation Paperclip. Paperclip. Yeah. And I kind of like Werner von Braun, frankly. You know, people say bad things about him. I think I don't think he was. I think he he was a good guy. But anyway, that's my theory. Um, anyway, there were a lot of bad, lot of bad Nazis. <laughs> Nazi science that was absorbed into the uh, U.S. establishment and the U.S. military industrial complex. And it wasn't just that, it was also Japan. And you had Hir uh, Hiro Ishii, the general who was responsible for upwards of 500,000 uh, murders utilizing bio uh, experiments, chemical weapons and other things on POWs and Chinese civilians throughout World War II. A lot of Russian, a lot of American POWs were dissected after being exposed to various forms of smallpox, other things, while they were alive. Horrifying stuff. Now, was this guy punished? Hells no. He was absorbed into, he got a job at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Um, his whole, with his whole staff. 
Um, this was quickly absorbed and assimilated as part of what was uh, the, the operating system in the Cold War against the Soviets. And we saw the utilization of bioterror in uh, Korea, in um, Vietnam, um, against the American-owned population in the 1970s and 80s in a variety of ways. Um, so we already have like a large, a long-standing utilization of pathogens um, and, and utilizing human experiments, right? People uh, in asylums, people, I mean, uh, you know, I, I can go into MK Ultra as another aspect of this for the mm -hmm. you know, mind war stuff that also came from Nazi scientists and the British. Um, so, but I don't, that's, a, that's another conversation. So, but all that to say, there was already going on. They have a, an MO doing this for decades. And after 9-11, for sure, I, I alluded to this, the anthrax attacks, um, few people died, you know, a, a, a low level employee at Fort Detrick was thrown under the bus as a, as a patsy. You know, I think he died in a prison, um, saying that he radicalized himself watching too many videos of uh, recruitment videos from uh, Al Qaeda or something. And he just then decided to steal pathogens and, of anthrax and, and send it around the US government. But what that did uh, justify then, um, was the BioShield Act of 2004 under Dick Cheney and uh, Victoria Newland, Cheney's assistant, um, who then went on to be the ambassador at NATO. And uh, the BioShield Act turned out to be a $50 billion uh, bonanza of cash for the expanded bioweapons system, the complex. Um, it grew and it grew and Obama accelerated it. You know, Obama was a part of, uh, with, with Richard Lugar, another Rhodes Scholar, Senator. They uh, together were sent to Georgia where they established the Lugar Center and a variety of bioweapons laboratories there that Russia has been trying to get some transparency on. It's, these are very opaque things. Um, when Obama was in office, he then mm, passed the bill, as I mentioned, to create the Jupiter Centaur uh, biolabs, the bioweapons systems run by the Pentagon and the US, South Korea um, military systems. It, it, it's, it's, it, South Korea is a colony, okay? It's a military colony, it's not a nation state. There's 28,000 American troops, and the Jupiter Centaur uh, biolabs uh, are 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 very powerful. There there are protests that you're not being shown in the media in the West about these things um, that you could see if you go to Korean news. The Korean people, many politicians in in South Korea, are freaked out because they share a lot of the same genotypes as the Chinese, and obviously North Koreans. Um, and they're protesting against the fact that uh, you like weapons grade anthrax from these labs was caught in a FedEx uh, <laughs> uh, mail uh, mailing system. Um, that was that that was scandalous. But they're doing work on all sorts of various pathogens, uh, other things that I don't fully understand. But a lot of it is bad. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that the manifesto for how post 9-11 bioweapons would be utilized was written in the Rebuilding America's Defenses uh, Project for a New American Century report, which people can even read online. And it's very clear, this is September 2000, 2000 that it was published. I think a Kagan was, a, was with Wolfowitz were, to, was a lead author. And they write that in the 21st century, targeting Russia and China, of course, being the, the two most dangerous threats to a um, US hegemony, in the 21st century, warfare is going to take place, as they say, primarily in the domain of cyber, as well as in the domain of pathogens, which they say uh, could be targeted for ethnic uh, targeting. So every genotype from different ethnicities have different uh, signatures that could allow them to be, uh, certain people could be uh, rendered, um, could suffer a lot for a, a pathogen, which causes another genotype of a Caucasian, let's say, to not suffer very much. That's one thing that they put out directly, and they say that mm -hmm. this could now move with this current science from the domain of, of terror into a politically useful tool. And that's them literally saying it. I'm not even paraphrasing. So again, the Chinese and the Russians have spoken out a, a lot about this since 2013. I began noticing that there have been a lot of attempts by them to get the international community to look at this. Um, I know that uh, right now my hypothesis, and I think it's a pretty solid one, is that both Russia and China have been treating whatever the hell was released in 2020, in January, as a potential uh, weapon released that they don't fully understand. They've, they've been trying to keep control of how they respond what are, instead of abiding by whatever the, the you know, international rules-based orderistas want them to do. So for example, in China, they've been, they still have a robust, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say this, hydroxychloroquine, can I even say that? Um, no. 
No, I can't. <laughs> Probably I can't actually. Damn. No. I, I, no, I don't think I can say that word. I'm you sorry. Say the no, H no. word. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I and said they're it. not even using the H. They're using the C. Just the C by itself. Oh man, I, but don't worry about it. this. I don't know. All right, well, uh, it's too late. Point. We're live. Okay, okay we're yeah. live, everybody. Right, you're gonna have Go to. Away. You're gonna have to give us jobs now. That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, okay. so that's oh. it. That's my. That's in, in in short. That's how I'm thinking yeah. about how they're strategizing about it. They can't say certain things. They're trying to keep control of certain responses, and uh, that's what I'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of people who talked about like Shanghai, which has a lot of close ties to the West. That operation over there was to kind of yeah. weed out and find some people that they had to get rid of right now. Maybe. And that's why they're just now open for business. I heard that today and I was like, well, that does make some sense over there if they want to kind of go in there and grab what's what. Um, yeah. Sam, do you have any other questions, by the way? No, that, I mean, that's it. We've been going a while, but um, I, I do have one have last question. question. Yeah. yeah. Well, my last question is, is if this is pulled off by the new um anti-globalist anti-bilderberg regime of putin maybe merging with uh xi jinping and india together is what does that mean for Zelensky and the government in ukraine when this thing is over are they going to allow that particular type of government to stay or are they going no. to say john <laughs> you're out and yeah, no more west one. bullshit <laughs> yeah that second one for sure yeah. I mean, it's there's nothing to negotiate with. I mean, Zelensky is is a shell of a shell of a nothing. Like, there's nothing yeah. there. Um, so you need somebody to be a, a manager of that very. I mean, Ukraine has the most potential. I mean, it, it went from the highest per capita GDP country in 1989 um, of all Eastern Europe, and I think most of Europe as a whole. Like, it was really industrially advanced, high per capita living standards. It was like a tourist zone of the world. And it went down to like zero, bottom of the barrel, highest corruption, just now 30 years later after billions of dollars of aid given to them. Like, where did this aid go? What did we do, what restructure exactly? So um, I think that was the intent was to, there, there was no Nazi problem back there that was serious back in the, in the late eighties uh, because people had economic security. They were not easy to radicalize when they have faith in the future, a, a good quality job, they could feed their families. They, they're, they're productive, right? Um, it's hard to radicalize the people like that. Um, so it's only now, you know, after 30 years of shock therapy, economic rape, that people are in such a state of despair, demoralization. It's the same thing for the, for the Arab states too, right? Like go back to Kabul, 1971, there's pictures that look like modern day New York. Oh yeah. Women are walking around mm -hmm. like they're, you know, the hippie trail, right? Yeah, exactly. Fucking and, beautiful. uh, you know, totally. And so that was a population where women were getting education, um, like it was moving in a good direction and that had to be blown up in the 80s by Zbigniew. Um, and and as a consequence, yeah, you get more and more young people who don't have a sense of the future. They live in despair, nihilism. They're easy to radicalize. You offer them 500 bucks a month to uh, pick up a gun and maybe they'll get lucky and have some virgins, you know, and like they, they don't have knowledge. They have no ability to think critically about whether this interpretation of the Quran is right or wrong. They just, they, they need the money. And they're kind of like, again, existential and looking for an excuse out, you know? So that's um, that's the thing with Ukraine today. I think too, there's a lot. There's a big Nazi problem culturally. There's been decades of Azov training camps with, run by Svoboda and others uh, that have trained young kids to to learn how to like make bombs and and do Nazi drills and stuff. And, and you see videos and pictures of this stuff online. And it's scary. Yeah. So they had Blackwater go in there and train some fucking troops. That's the level they hit. Blackwater went in there and trained a lot of troops. It's just like. It's sick what we did to these countries. And we've done this before, whether it be Afghanistan with the Mujahideen. And now over here in Ukraine, we did it in Syria. We did it in Libya. We don't stop. And really, I, I would wish the American people would just wake up and look at the foreign policy and see what's going on around them because it is mm -hmm. completely disgusting. And anytime they, they pull those types of behavior, it's always going to come back home. The chickens are always going to come back to roost. And that's where we're at today. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and having this discussion. It was very productive, very interesting. I'm sure to the audience. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you. you. Anytime you want to do this again, let me know. It's fun. Well, okay, next sure. week we want you to come on the morning show. Uh, and Steve <laughs> is licking his chops, right? We That great panel you have with Tom Luongo, Ian Davis. We already had Tom and Ian on. So now we got to get you on there and have some more fun because this is some amazing stuff that you talked about. And really to tell you the truth, it's right now everything is like playing out in front of our very own eyes. Uh, yeah. You know, this is like some serious stuff, whether it become this kind of like transhumanistic kind of agenda with all these bio labs and everything that's going on or what Putin's actually doing over there, because it really does seem evident that 
everybody else around him is like freaking out from what he's doing. So that's why I'm kind of leaning more towards the theories that you guys have talked to about uh, you and Tom, that is. And I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. This has been an, an amazing uh, conversation today, Matt. Thank you, guys. Till All next right, time. See you next time. Bye. Later, brother. Bye. So, um, Matt Errett, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>